We are in the middle of a new information war between Ukraine and Russia. The roots of this date back to the start of the invasion, including the initial declaration of a special military operation. However, with Ukraine's struggles on the offensive last year, it has now become a focal point of the war. Look around and you will find it everywhere. You see it playing out on television, in the newspapers, and yes, even YouTube comments. The message from the Kremlin? That Ukraine's struggle is hopeless, and that the West would be better off not wasting its money on a losing effort. The West's message? That they are here for the long haul. This is the Information War of 2024. As the full-scale war in Ukraine approaches its two-year anniversary, it is hard to understate the importance of long-term planning in war. Now, if you want to get a feel for this, and have some fun, there is no better game than today's sponsor, Conflict of Nations. Conflict of Nations is a free, online, player-versus-player -player strategy game. You pick a real country during World War III and compete against up to 128 other players in real time over vast campaigns that can take weeks to complete. You are in control of the strategy. Build your military the way you see fit, invade your neighbors, or strike an alliance. And don't worry if you are on the go, because Conflict of Nations works across platforms, both on PC and mobile. And good news! Lines on Maps enthusiasts get an exclusive gift, 13,000 gold and a one-month premium subscription for free by using the link in the description. But hurry, because this deal is only good for 30 days. Okay, if we are on a search for answers, it always helps to have a plan. To outline where we are going today, we will begin with a review of the traditional Lines on Maps theory of information and war before putting Ukraine's 2023 offensive in the context of this. Then we will explore the wide variety of unanswered questions regarding the war, or what we might call the unsolved mysteries, in the rough order of when we will start getting some idea of the underlying truth. The effect of attackums, Ukraine's ability to open a southern front, Russia's ability to make serious progress, the stability of the Kremlin as it relates to the upcoming presidential election in March, whether Russia can effectively mobilize, the effect of F-16s, the health of the Russian economy, and finally, the US presidential election in November. Oh, and we will also learn how Putin prefers his eggs. Place your bets in the comments now. But we begin with some classic lines on maps theory, with a focus on the informational aspects of war. Time to get excited. The idea of an information war implies that there is some sort of fundamental underlying truth about the world that is privately, but not publicly, known, and that the sides are trying to manipulate perceptions about that private truth. The two most relevant factors here on each side are resolve and military capacity, basically how much each side is willing to continue and their ability to achieve favorable outcomes on the battlefield. We can put this in the context of Lines on Maps theory. Recall how if both sides can plot out what the expected outcome of the war will be, say this completely made up white line here, then continuing the war is fruitless. After all, people will die and stuff will get destroyed in the meantime. We can capture this in the map from before with this yellow line. The space between it and the white line represents how Ukraine internalizes those costs in terms of territory, and the space between this red line and the white line being analogous for Russia. If these were the only concerns, then we would expect coercive bargaining instead of war. Brutal and ruthless, yes, but also less deadly. However, in a world with disagreement over, say, martial capacity, Ukraine may feel unwilling to budge if it believes the balance of power lies over here, but Russia might want to try its luck because it believes the balance of power is over there. The point of the information war is to convince the other side that their perspective is correct without fully finishing the process on the battlefield, or if they are actually weak, to bluff their way for long enough that the other side backs down anyway. So everything you hear from a press secretary everything you see on Twitter. You know what? I wrote Twitter in the script, so we're just going to go with it. And every questionable comment you see on YouTube, enjoy it with a grain of salt, or maybe a jar's worth. After all, the incentives to overrepresent one's hand here are strong. To be clear, 
and this will be important for later. Mutual uncertainty is not good enough for a war to occur. For example, no one really knows whether it will be raining in Zaporizhia on April 15th at 11 a.m. Insofar as the various complications from rain will affect the war outcome, that is why we call the white line the expected war outcome. Double emphasis on expected. If there is a 50-50 chance of rain or dry conditions, and the outcomes wildly swing in these directions depending on that, then the parties can just bargain around the average. Rather, you need private information for this to be a problem. For example, if weather forecasters in Kyiv are way more accurate than their counterparts in Moscow, and they know that there will be favorable dry conditions, which in turn causes a divergence in the expectations between the two, then that will be a problem for bargaining. Now let's put Ukraine's 2023 offensive in the context of this. Going in, there was a clear divergence in the public narratives. One proclaiming that Ukraine would continue to rack up the wins, as if this were a proper continuation of the 2022 counteroffensives, while the other argued that Russian lines would hold, and this would be a waste of everyone's time. More precisely, Ukraine wagered that the influx of Western-trained troops would give it the advantage on the ground. Meanwhile, Russia had placed its bet that the defensive lines that Sergei Surovikin spent the winter building would not be breached. Having advanced into the year 2024, we know that Russia's world perspective was closer to the truth. We previously explored why this was the case, so I will not retread that ground here. In any case, if that were the only disagreement about the fundamentals of the war, we would expect everyone to pack it in and call it a day. But it is not. Rather, it is one piece of a broader puzzle. If these were the beliefs entering the offensive, then they look something like this now. Again, do not pay attention to where the actual lines are, because that part is made up. I am a professor, not an intelligence agency. Rather, track the movement. Both beliefs shift to the left, updating for the struggles that Ukraine faced. Just how far is part of the debate? Again, that is why we call it an information war, and I am sure that Ukraine would like to point out that it had plenty of success on the Black Sea, while everyone else was focusing on what was happening on land instead. Regardless, the left-shifting part should be obvious, and it may seem like this gets us no closer to resolving things, because now Russia is demanding more. Ukraine, meanwhile, has become more reticent, even as frustration there mounts. The apparent problem is that we are just moving expectations rather than building a military consensus. And indeed, this tripped up researchers in my field for a long time. However, the key thing is that Ukraine's belief should shift further to the left, as compared to how far Russia's shifts. The difference there means that the parties are growing closer to the military truth, and it works because the new information was inconsistent with Ukraine's prior expectations, but was consistent with Russia's. Now, the logic operates in reverse whenever something good happens for Ukraine. This time, Russia's belief should move further to the right than how far Ukraine's belief moves. Zooming out to the big picture, whichever way those lines are moving, once you factor in the costs, it is not necessary to have complete agreement before the need to keep fighting ceases. But it does not seem that the parties are there yet. So what else may be throwing a wrench in reaching an endpoint to the war? Well, recapping, we had then, and now. But this is not forever. Together, they will keep learning about the underlying situation. And with that in mind, we need to turn to the war's unsolved mysteries. Well, first up in the order that we might be getting answers is Atakums, or Atakums, if that's how you want to say it. These are the long-ranged missiles that fire from high Mars trucks. Ukraine wanted them at the beginning of its offensive to weaken Russia's supply lines and materiel holdings. Kirchbridge beware. Nonetheless, for whatever reason, low U.S. stockpiles, concerns about escalation, or otherwise, 
Washington held out. Then suddenly Attackums destroyed a bunch of Russian helicopters sitting in Berdyansk. These were critical chess pieces for the Kremlin, because they were on call to deploy wherever Ukraine attacked the front lines. The unsolved mystery was how many Attackums Ukraine was going to receive, and whether there would be any follow-up. Well, two months later, everything has gone silent. So it is possible that this question has already been answered. But there is also the possibility that Ukraine is saving them for some sort of coordinated mass strike. So maybe hold that thought. Next up is Ukraine's attempt to open a front across the Dnipro River. This has been going on for a couple of months now, and the information war there is burning bright, with tales of Ukraine establishing a foothold and dealing moderate damage, to an alternative account where it has been nothing but a disaster. Let's look at a map for a second. No, no, a real one. Thank you. Given the tight space and tough logistics, it is hard to imagine that any sort of middle ground can be sustainable in the long run. Either Ukraine successfully pushes out to reduce its vulnerability, or Russia forces Ukraine to retreat back across the river. The latter outcome will only enforce the status quo, while success gives Ukraine the opportunity for follow-on attacks, in areas not touched since the first days of the war. On the other side of that coin is Russia's ability to conduct an offensive. Again, to the map. The main thrust is going on near Avdivka, just a quick drive from Donetsk City, a de facto Russian stronghold since 2014. We have talked about this one in depth before, but in the context of Unsolved Mysteries, the puzzle here is whether Russia can make any cost-effective gains in a world where the Wagner Group is no longer leading human meat wave attacks. Not that Russia is not trying something similar on its own. Real-life Zerg rushes aside, if the answer to this question is no, and Ukraine sees a similar freeze, you are going to start hearing more voices in the West that press Ukraine to accept the front as the new status quo. Although that may be a bit premature, we still have other topics to discuss here, it is worth talking a little more about what that would look like. The Korean War serves as an example. You did not have the major political players sitting in a grand ballroom, shaking hands and signing documents, as in days of yore. Rather, it was a muted affair, in a nondescript area, and merely an armistice rather than a formal end of the war. Moreover, its images never reached the same level of fame as comparable conflicts. But hey, at least Kim Il-sung was there. Similarly, you will not get Putin and Zelensky sitting down and shaking hands. You may not get any signatures on any pieces of paper at all. Just a front line still technically at war, but casualties drying up because they have stopped shooting at one another. There will still be what we might call the war after the war, but that is a topic for another time. Next up is the Russian presidential election. Let me be explicit about this. The interesting point here is not the vote totals themselves. Rather, it is the aftermath. Consider it to be a barometer of how Russians feel regarding the situation in Ukraine. Will it go off without a hitch? With the only gatherings being celebrations of Putin's victory like this one? Or will it serve as a coordinating call for massive protests on the streets, with cries that it did not represent the will of the people? We will get our answers beginning on March 15th, the first day of voting. Though we know when this unsolved mystery will be solved, the amount of information that will be gleaned from it is likely to be small. That is because expectations are very high that not much will actually happen. Thus, the modal outcome is a big Russian yawn. But because no one expects anything to happen, barely anyone will change their minds about the stability of Putin's position if indeed nothing happens. That is just how Bayes' rule works. Apologies for the math, but the basic idea is that if you already think someone is really strong, and you see evidence of strength, you cannot really move your belief by much, because there is not much space for it to move. 
Rather, this is just an opportunity, if an unlikely one, for something dramatic to happen. Perhaps the more interesting aspect about the election is what might happen in the weeks afterward, as it relates to mobilization. It has been a while. Russia has not engaged in any serious mobilization efforts since September 2022, instead relying on some combination of attractive wages, especially to those living in the East, prison recruitment, and some combination of immigrant inducements and impressment. And maybe it has worked. After all, they have not mobilized. However, for the past four months, give or take, the Kremlin has had significant incentives to not do so. First because of local elections in September 2023, and then the upcoming presidential election. The earlier mobilization caused a notable drop in Putin's approval rating. Given that, mobilizing right before a sensitive time would be like playing with fire. The first windows to obtain new information about this would be late March or early April, after the election, with a bit of a cooldown to not make it suspicious. Nevertheless, interpreting the meaning either way will be difficult. If there is no mobilization, is it because Russia's military position is good, or because Putin is still worried about domestic instability? It removes the middle ground but keeps in the extremes. Similarly, if there is mobilization, it indicates that Russia's position is vulnerable enough to require more men in Ukraine, but that Putin is not all that worried about domestic upheaval. Whatever happens will require putting it in the context with what else is known about the situation at the time once we reach it. Something that will take longer to figure out is what is going on with the F-16s. They are coming. Maybe at some point. It is a variety of sources, so something will eventually happen. Right? Prior to the 2023 offensive, Ukrainian troops went to NATO countries to study combined arms operations. They were promptly sent back to Ukraine to maneuver using those combined arms, but without the air support part, which kind of defied the whole combined part of it. The reason that F-16s are so far down the pecking order, in terms of when we will get answers to this unsolved mystery, is because Ukraine will not be interested in another offensive until things dry out. I am sure that this was unintentional on the part of Ukraine's official photographers, but darn it if I am not going to get a ton of use out of this shirt. It really is perfect, isn't it? And even seasonal rain aside, it is unclear whether Ukraine would not want to wait a year after saving up on artillery, which it still desperately needs. The point is that it will be a while until Ukraine actually puts any F-16s into full effect, though they will provide helpful air defense in the meantime. This has become subtly important as the war turned to another round of infrastructure targeting. As long as the F-16s might take, even longer will be answering questions about Russia's economy, and in turn the stability of the Kremlin. Ah, monetary policy. It was the central topic from a couple of months ago. The short version is that Russia faced an absolute economic crisis at the start of the war. However, the central bank competently handled the situation to keep Russia afloat. The only problem there was that, like a lot of Russia's other solutions, they were short-term bandages that did not address the underlying problem. That was, of course, the war. As such, this is not a criticism of the Russian bureaucracy. The central bank was just trying its best given the enormous constraint that it faced. But toward the end of 2023, inflation was again on the rise. In December, the central bank raised interest rates to 16%. For comparison, this is approaching the 20% rate from the start of the war, though the plan is for that to be the last increase. To be determined. The basic idea is that when interest rates go up, consumers see borrowing as more expensive, so fewer people buy using credit, and more people start putting more money in the bank. Overall, that means money is getting pulled from the economy. So while it was previously this amount of money, chasing this amount of products, giving us these prices. Now it is this amount of money, chasing the same amount of products, and so prices go down. Or at least the prices do not continue to go up, 
and your consolation prize is just a freeze to inflation. This is also why Putin is spending a non-trivial amount of his hours worrying about eggs of all things. Seriously, if you have not heard of this before, spend a few minutes looking into it. Doing so will be an excellent use of your time. It was a recurring subject at Putin's year-end town hall meeting. Wait, hold up. Ten eggs in one morning? That is a lot of protein. But it certainly does make sense of his more athletic hobbies. Also, if you had Putin preferring his eggs scrambled, then congratulations, you are a winner. I will try my best to like your comment. Also, also, looks like this is another victory for the wisdom of the crowds. Anyway, Putin would really prefer it if his election results were sunny side up, and for any protests to be over easy. But this is currently the issue at the greatest risk of making it hard-boiled. Just how long it will take before it could scramble Russian politics is not obvious, because this is another one of those things that will depend on Russian citizens coordinating on protests. But if I had to take a crack at it, these things take a long time. Take a look at the phrasing of the question that led to Putin's 10 scrambled eggs response. It treats Putin as the solution to the problem caused by others. Now, obviously, this was part of a well-choreographed media push. But this mindset is common in Russia, and Putin is in little danger until a switch flips on that thinking. Even aside from that, the central bank has enough levers to delay deeper problems, even if it cannot fully solve them. The more immediate concern is when those egg consumers get fed up and begin protesting due to the belief of an impending economic disaster. Pro tip. Never cross the pensioners. We'll have to talk more about that soon. Finally, we have the November U.S. presidential election. Let freedom ring. This promises to be one of the most important elections for U.S. domestic politics, but a lot is on the line for the war as well. Biden wants to expand aid to Ukraine. A relatively small segment of congressional Republicans do not though the congressional elections that run concurrently with the presidential race could change that. Meanwhile, Trump has consistently expressed skepticism of continued aid while on the 2024 campaign trail. January polling puts the two candidates on essentially level ground if the election were held right this second, though betting markets have Trump as the favorite. This assumes that Trump makes it out of the primary, which is very likely, but also not a guarantee. Nikki Haley polls better than Trump in the general election, but their Ukraine policies are roughly similar, and so we do not need to focus on that. And speaking of things that we do not need to focus on, as of this week, Ron DeSantis. Back to Biden versus Trump. Clearly, who wins the election will have an effect on where the lines go, and there is a lot of uncertainty about which of these that we will actually get to. This also assumes that Trump does not do a 180 once he gets into office. Who knows? In any case, remember, for uncertainty to cause a problem within this framework, there must be private information about which outcome, that is, who wins, is more likely. Asymmetric information and unknown information are not the same thing. As a result, it is not obvious that uncertainty is actually a problem here. Now, the anticipation that there will be a change of administrations can be an issue. But that is present even when both parties know it is going to happen. Thus, it is a different mechanism, and, in turn, a topic for another time. I guess it will be a waning game until then. And thanks again to today's sponsor, Conflict of Nations, the free online military strategy game. Assume control of your army today and get those lines on maps moving. And remember this exclusive gift. Use the link below for 13,000 gold and a one-month premium subscription for free. Offer good for 30 days.